while we were waiting for oh, everyone oh, to start, um, for us to start, could you go on and record your name and also include uh, where you're from and your role in your district in the chat function? We're going to use the chat function to communicate with each other. And you could also start inputting some of the insights you're hoping to gain from the webinar. My name is Ricky Price Baugh, and I'm the Director of Academic Achievement for the Council of the Great City Schools, one of the co-sponsors with Student Achievement Partners for our webinar today. We are so glad that you joined us tonight for the final webinar in our three-part series dedicated to addressing unfinished learning and the use of essential content. This session is being recorded and the recording will be shared. And because there's so many participants, all of you will be muted, but we're encouraging you to use the chat to pose any logistical questions or to ask questions of the panelists or share information with others in the audience. We really couldn't do this webinar without the behind the scenes help of our partners that you see listed on this slide. My colleague, Denise Walston, will be working with me as leaders in four school districts share their experience and the next steps they're thinking of in addressing unfinished learning. As you know, the council and student achievement partners collaborated in the development of two complementary documents that are the foundation for our webinar series. Addressing unfinished learning after COVID-19 closures includes a rationale for why we need to focus on grade level learning. And it illustrates specific strategies to more effectively address that unfinished learning so that we can enable every student to participate meaningfully in grade level instruction. SAP's priority instructional content defines the essential learning in language arts and mathematics. This gives teachers time to focus and deepen understanding of the most important concepts required for the grade level or course. And knowing these same concepts are going to be expanded and extended in subsequent grade levels and courses. We've posted links to these documents in the chat. As we wait for others to join, please continue using the chat to let us know what insights you hope to gain for this webinar. And I'm going to ask Denise, uh, as she monitors the chat, to call out what some of the comments are that you're seeing. They are beginning to come in. Um, waiting to for some people to respond to that the question on the screen. What insights are you planning? Are you hoping to gain tonight? You're free to add those as we go. But uh, here's one, Ricky, hoping okay. to learn about how to assist teachers in identifying and addressing student learning loss, how to reach the students who struggle with academic learning, and looking forward to hearing how others are essentializing standards. Um, another one, how to address the desire to expose students to all standards. This year, many have the feeling and don't think they can do deep can go deep due to time. Um, and then, you know, questions about how do you support leaders in this work? And there are a couple about even thinking about what's going to happen for summer school, how to run a summer academy to accelerate learning rather than talking about loss. I love that rather than talking about loss. And what systemic changes are needed. And I know we're going to hear a lot about that tonight. Uh, with the people that we have on this panel. 
How do we address lack of student attendance and participation? Um, not turning in assignments and lack of parent support. We are gonna hear about some things that you can do to address parent engagement. Um, this particular person said, we already have materials and structures in place for addressing learning loss, but need um, students to show up to their online intervention. Uh, provide, so, yeah, so, so it's a lot of good questions. We can't, we can't questions. name all of them. There's yeah. a lot of great questions. And it sounds like we really have the foundation for a complete yes. uh, series of additional webinars to answer them. But this is very helpful to us. Um, you know, skill gaps and incomplete learning and misconceptions and unfinished learning, they've always been a natural part and a necessary part of the teaching and learning process. It's just that they're more pronounced this year. Traditional forms of remediation and pullouts, however, are not effective practices because they keep students away from important grade level learning and the very kinds of interactions that will engage them and excite them about learning. In the first webinar, the writers of the two documents clearly laid a rationale for why we must keep the focus on grade level content and rigor while approaching learning gaps with well-designed, specific, just-in-time support that would give all children access to that content. They discussed prioritizing content to clarify where teachers should invest their time, their resources and effort. And we also heard from Broward County Public Schools that presented on how they operationalize those major changes. The second webinar provided both teacher and curriculum leaders perspectives on addressing unfinished learning. They featured concrete examples from Denver Public Schools, San Diego Unified School District, and San Antonio Independent School District. Which brings us to this evening's webinar entitled Leadership Perspectives, Best Practices and a Path Forward. You'll hear from central office and school instructional leaders who are translating this theory into practice. You see here that our panelists all work in large urban districts. Most of their students are working in remote settings, but one of the districts offers classes in a variety of settings. All of them have highly diverse student bodies and the majority of their students qualify for free and reduced price lunch. So let me introduce our panelists. We have Allison Towery and Heather Caruza from Los Angeles Unified School District, Sophia Rudidi, Ali Martinez, and Patrick Callahan for the San Diego Unified School District, Kathy Martin from Denver Public Schools, Kathy Schuler from Florida's Orange County Public Schools. They're going to provide their perspectives on successes they've had in dealing with unfinished learning and essential content. And, and then they're going to share with us in a second section, some of what they're planning to ensure continuous improvement this spring and next school year. So Allison, I hear you're focusing on student voice in Los Angeles. Could you tell us a little more about this? Sure, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. It's nice to be with you today. Um, you know, in Los Angeles, in the pandemic, one of the things that we've really been focusing on in Los Angeles is keeping schools at the center of our work. And in a district that's our size, um, you know, we really had to make a concerted effort to do that. So today we brought some students right to you uh, to share a little bit about their feeling about distance learning. And um, so we'll start with that and then we'll, Come back together and talk. One thing that definitely worked 
during distance learning was sort of having outside of the classroom activities. So for example, one thing that Westchester did a lot is we had a few game days over Zoom during lunch or whatever. And those were super successful. It got really great feedback from both students and teachers who were involved. To only use like maybe two or three websites at most to assign either homework or in-class assignments on um, because some of my teachers, and I know that they have a reason for it because there are a lot of cool websites out there, but um, when you have so many different websites that you have to log into for to do an assignment or to do your homework, it can get really confusing. One thing that I think all teachers can start doing or continue doing if they're already doing is um, continue to make themselves available or make it easier for students to reach out to them and ask questions because I found myself not wanting to ask a question in a Zoom class. Or incorporate more of would be student group projects, um, which kind of promotes more student social interaction. Uh, one thing that I found works with my teachers are group discussions that are like relevant to us as students. Um, and that gets a lot of participation when we're talking about interesting subjects that relate both to the subject at hand and students. Thank you. Uh, in my opinion, what worked includes when teachers laid out a clear lesson plan and gave students weekly updates as to what we're working on and what we're working towards. I think it was really helpful in knowing that we are moving forward in our education and we're not just constantly going over the same thing. One thing that definitely worked during distance learning so that's a little preview, um, actually, of what we're going to be sharing with all of our teachers um, in Los Angeles when we get back in January um, as part of our, our professional development the first day back. Um, and really, this is an exceptional time. We're, you know, looking at the digital divide. We are on our quest for racial equity, gender equity, social equity. And we thought no better way than to really hear from students about what their experiences have been so we could better our teaching and that just in time learning. Um, so today, Dr. Caruza and I are here. Um, she's from Fleming Middle School. And we had done this, um, we had done this uh, promotion for teachers by teachers. And really it was about four practi practitioners by practitioners. So principals leading principals, teachers leading teachers, students leading the district. And um, we wanted to highlight Dr. Caruza today because of the incredible work she's doing. And I really wanted to share um, a couple more slides before I turned over to her, because at the district level, we were looking at, at the next slide, student-friendly uh, priority learning targets this year. So if you think about, um, you know, what are those priority standards for algebra one, for example, we have nine learning targets um, that are written in student-friendly language. Uh, we have curriculum maps that we had done just prior to the, the shutdown. Um, on the next slide that really sh was developed by teacher teams that looks at timing, you know, standards, learning targets, assessments, and resources for teachers then to teach. Um, and then on the next slide, uh, what aligned assessments might be. So that's at the big district level. Um, and the reason I wanted Dr. Cruz to share today is because we're really, again, trying to see what's happening at our school so we can support that and grow that. And so I wanted to contrast that with something that she's doing at her school. So I'd love to turn it over to Dr. Carissa now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Towery. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And at Fleming, uh, we have, you know, assessments are only as good as the data as you use it. And so we give frequent formative assessments to our students actually in math every week but we use the data and we in incorporate it with a feedback loop so that not only are teachers getting data to use for their instruction, but students are being empowered with their own data. They need to know what they don't know and they need to know what they need to study and how they're progressing throughout. And this really helps build their metacognition, their self-advocacy, and they know what targets they can focus on to really improve. It's all about learning now, right? It's not always about participation, it's about learning. And so uh, next slide, please. We can see even from the distance learning that we are still growing. So even though we closed schools in March and we have not been back uh, in person since then, our students are progressing and doing better in the next grade level than they did the previous grade level. Next click, please. 
And we see even from year to year, as we give the same initial diagnostic, students are starting out at a level that's higher than the kids previously. And so we know that this is really impacting their learning. And um, you know, we're digging in and, and doing all we can to help our teachers and help our students through this tough time too. That is a lot to think about and very helpful, putting the students at the center and helping them have the agency to know where they are in their learning process. Thank you both very much. Let's turn to San Diego. San Diego's approach to distance learning and unfinished learning was to develop a prioritization of learning domains. So what formative assessment structures did you put in place? Um, Allie? Thank you, Ricky. I'm really proud to be here with uh, Patrick Callahan and Sophia Raditi and uh, Patrick and I are gonna share a little bit um, in response to that question. Uh, if you can jump to the next slide. Um, we're gonna be giving you a little sense of what our prioritization was, uh, really thinking about what are those essential domains and how we implemented a district-wide formative assessment. So I'll hand it over to Patrick to talk through briefly what our um, prioritization looked like. Thank you, Allie. Um, so one of the things that we heard a lot about was with school closures and a shift to distance learning was how are we possibly going to cover everything we did before? And if we have to cut instruction, isn't that going to dilute the curriculum? Isn't that going to lower rigor? And I think one of our major accomplishments through the leadership in San Diego was actually to uh, do the opposite. We actually prioritized radically taking the number of lessons down by 50%. And we believe by focusing on community and writing, we created a more rigorous course than was there before. We have a little animation to help with this. Let's see how it works. So people are asking, how is it possible you could do less? You can go ahead and animate this. How is it possible you could do less? And so the analogy is think about a diet that has a lot of junk food and a lot of empty calories. If you eliminate those, you are doing less, but you're focusing on healthy, nutritious foods. This is what we did to the math curriculum. Our prioritization wasn't just cutting standards, it was actually focusing on the most healthy and nutritious parts of the math curriculum. And it gave us an opportunity to remove a lot of the unhealthy stuff. This gave teachers permission and encouragement to focus on the best parts of mathematics and leave time for rigor and community building. And so one of the things that was really exciting is that once we had done that prioritization, we wanted to make sure that we had a district-wide formative assessment in place, um, what we affectionately call the DEMI or the District Essential Mathematics Indicators Assessment. Uh, we designed it to promote student agency and growth and fuel teacher community around powerful data fuel, um, in particular student writing and reasoning. A few exciting things that we want to point out about the assessment itself is that it was in, it's administered across grade bands and it was developed with an asset based lens. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Let me make sure I'm following along with you. Uh, so one of the things that we think is really exciting about the DEMI is it offers a window into student thinking and it offers actionable data similarly to what we just heard. Data isn't, isn't really valuable unless it offers action. And what we like about the DEMI is it offers actionable data within the classroom, at the site level and the district wide level. We really wanted to shift away from assessing long lists of micro skills and shift towards a focus on larger domains um, in, that, in those essential mathematics and we did that by making sure that every item falls into one of our categories of knowledge, application, and communication. Additionally, we included an adapted Joe Bowler mindset survey, and that, gave, that gives us a window into how we're developing um, student identity and if we're having a positive, fostering a positive math culture. So I'm gonna hand it over to Patrick now to give you a sense of what this data can yield and how powerful it is. Thank you. So one of the things that is innovative, we believe, is that we gave the same exact items to multiple grade bands, sometimes as many as uh, uh, six through 12, all middle school and high schools. Here's an example of a performance task. I know you can't read it, but the basic idea is that we wanted to invite students into some problem solving and then ask them to write a mathematical explanation. 
the district has put writing as one of their LCAP goals, and this has been essential in having us focus on the rigor in the classroom and not fall back into those micro skills. One thing you notice is that although there are some trends where more students are getting the right answer, um, the ep explanations remain pretty flat. And so this really is what gives us the motivation to go in and focus on rich curriculum and instructional strategies that explicitly target sense-making, writing, and communication. Next slide. So again, if you look at these grade bands, we have embraced the Council of Great City Schools uh, idea of uh, essential domains, and we've implemented it by having these common items cross multiple grade levels. And uh, although you can't see these ideas like ratio, operations, base 10, these are all the critical transitions that we know are so important for student success and access. And so we've embraced these two pieces. One, the idea that uh, we had to prioritize by cutting down to the most uh, essential and important mathematics, and then align that with an assessment that embraces that as well. And it has the additional benefit by not having every single grade be separate. It means that teachers at sites can talk about um, learning across the grades and across grade levels. And so we also are building more community for the teachers to work around student learning and student growth. Thank you. This, this idea of building communities and, and thinking across grade levels, uh, we, we hope that we'll be able to come back and talk about that in greater detail because that's the kind of working together where all students belong to all the teachers. Uh, so thank you both very much. Uh, let's hear from Denver. Uh, Kathy, how are you using formative assessments to accelerate students who have unfinished learning? Kathy, you want to unmute yourself? I knew I would do that. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about that. Um, so I want to begin with acknowledging that uh, when I refer to unfinished uh, learning, um, I'm referring to the prerequisite skills and concepts that are critical to student engagement in grade level content and are ones that they may not have facility with yet. And we all know that all unfinished learning uh, or that not all unfinished learning has the same impact on students' ability to engage in grade level content. So an example of that is thinking about an incoming sixth grader who might not be fluent with multi-digit multiplication, which is a fifth grade standard. However, that student can still access the sixth grade standards of solving real world and mathematical problems involving area, surface area, and volume. All of those problems use multiplication and provide further opportunity for students to develop that fluency. Next slide. So when we think about diagnosing unfinished learning, we look to uncover what understanding a student has so that we build from those understandings. We're not looking to find out what students don't know. We wanna diagnose from an asset-based perspective. So when do we diagnose in Denver? We do so at the unit level, which is allows us to support unfinished learning just in time so that students are able to make connections between previous learning and current learning. We also gather data about unfinished learning from classroom discussions, conversations with students, and written work to diagnose as the learning is in progress rather than needing to stop and give a test. In Denver, in thinking about diagnosing unfinished learning, we've turned to our own grade level curriculum materials and are using those to diagnose while simultaneously engaging students in grade level learning. In mathematics, this means selecting a rich mathematical task to both diagnose and consolidate unfinished learning. 
On the next slide, we have an example in mathematics of using a task from our curriculum just in time to do diagnosis of prerequisite understanding. This is a third grade task and students are asked to solve a problem involving multi-digit addition. Using the task provides diagnostic information on students second grade understanding of representing and solving one step problems involving addition and using place value understanding and properties of equation operations to add and subtract, um, which is foundational to solving the two-step word problems using equations with a variable in third grade. So on the next slide, please. At the district level, we've provided multiple resources to support schools with using formative assessment to diagnose unfinished learning. One resource is we've identified the essential understandings or learnings for all courses to guide teachers. A second resource is we've revised scope and sequence documents so that each unit identifies the, pre, the critical prerequisite understandings a lesson or a task that can be used to diagnose un any unfinished learning, and then tasks throughout the unit that provide re-engagement opportunities with those skills and concepts and suggestions for progress monitoring. And third, we've engaged our students in the uh, process of unit internalization. And by unit internalization, we're talking about a deep study and analysis of a curriculum unit to ensure that teachers have understanding of the essential learning in the unit, how each lesson, lesson supports that learning, and then reflection on how to provide just-in-time scaffolds to address unfinished learning. And all of this is grounded in our mindset of high expectations to ensure that all of our students have access to and are successful with grade level content. Well, let me see if I can summarize a little bit of what I've just heard from these districts. Your districts are using formative assessments to determine how to bring students into a unit of grade level study and instruction, not whether to bring them in, but how best to do it. And you have a goal that teachers will use the data to understand how to support the students as they work by weaving in attention to unfinished learning in service to what it takes to be successful in grade level work. And it sounds like a great deal of professional development, community building, uh, deepening of understanding. All of this seems to be part of what you are working on and doing in your districts. Um, we also know though that the pandemic has had some other far reaching implications. And I'm going to turn to um, Kathy Schuler in Orange County public schools because the pandemic has offered an opportunity to really work with parents and reach out to them in ways that uh, are very different from before. So Kathy, can you talk to us about how you are reaching out to parents and community right now? Sure, Ricky, thank you. And I'm just delighted to be here with the Council of Great City Schools and the educators across the nation. Um, the Council of Great City Sc of Schools has just been a wonderful resource for Orange County Public Schools and many other districts. But when we think about our parents, parental support, our parental support, if you turn to the next slide, please, has always revolved around addressing four strands, supporting student success, getting involved, promoting the well-being of our students and embracing multiculturalism. However, we learn quickly to meet the expansive needs of our parents and engage them in addressing unfinished learning, we had to pivot. This pandemic has really caused 
us to rethink the way we do business in Orange County Public Schools with our parents. We surveyed our parents. Our parents and community members wanted to know how we were going to educate their children safely. Um, beginning in January, we're going to have about 50% of our students come back to us face to face. So they wanted to know how we were going to mitigate the learning loss, how we were going to support those students learning at home while supporting those students face to face. They wanted to know how we were going to support our ESE students, our ELL students, and our subgroups while meeting the social emotional needs and the health of their child. Sounds familiar, correct? So once we gathered all of this information from the surveys, we knew that we had to provide outreach to meet their expansive needs. So we continue to utilize news conferences. We uh, utilize the local media, county and city officials, radio stations, social media, and the superintendent's update to, to communicate with our parents about the changes that are going on in Orange County Public Schools. We visit our homeless shelters. We even do face-to-face -face visits. And we have visited local daycare centers. We found that some of our students that are learning at home are really being um, housed at the daycare centers because their parents have to work. So we found that we had to provide training to those uh, workers that are there at the daycare center so they could access our digital, our technology and our curriculum online. Um, we're providing meals to our students across learning communities on every holiday break, teacher work day, and even to the students that are learning at home. We give them an opportunity to walk to school or their parents can drive them during lunch to pick up a meal. We have a hotline number and it's posted where parents can ask frequently asked questions on our website. We did this the first few months of school, actually the first three months, and we made sure that we provided a response within 24 to 48 hours. We also are utilizing Facebook to exchange messaging with our parents and answer questions. Uh, we partnered with our local school board members to have live community virtual webinars. Yes, we were on the hot seat many days, but um, that seat often got cold for us. We are partnering with our local government agencies, our hospitals, and our CAO team actually supports our superintendent who has a medical advisory board that provides us information, resources, and advice in regards to how to safely support our students while they're in school face-to-face. -face. We have an information helpline that's attended by our social worker and our mental health counselor where teachers, parents, and family members can reach out to access resources for mental health support. Our social workers even conduct home driveway porch visits and they visit our local community centers to provide resources for our parents and round our students up. I heard someone say, how do we get our students back? How do we get our students to participate? So we really utilize our social workers. We also utilize our PALS, which are parent liaisons that are in all of our Title I schools. And then for parent learning, I'm gonna move on when we talk about parent learning. I'd like to move to that next slide, please, where I'm addressing those uh, circles there. So when we talk about parent learning, we host district-wide parent academies virtually, and then we host virtual academies specific to the learning communities. We have about nine learning communities, and you can see that on this slide in the center of that triangle, where we provide training on how parents can support their child in reading, math, advocacy, SEL, SEL, equity, and inclusion. We also provide virtual PD specifically for our ELL and our ESE students. Um, as you can see in one of the examples on this slide, where we talked about a day in a life for an ESC student and what that would look like learning from home. Many of our trainings are asynchronous, where they're actually recorded live with parents so that parents can actually view them later. We're partnering with the University of Central Florida, where we have lessons on one of our local television stations where parents can actually access lessons that aligned with the lesson plans that the teachers have, focusing on our primary grades and the priority standards. These are also recorded as well and posted on our website and YouTube. We're working with our local colleges and universities to provide virtual college fairs, FAFSA nights, and college and career 
and virtual counseling. Our student services team, we still have mentorship going on, revolving around equity and advocacy through our clubs, such as Males of Color, My Brother's Keeper, and Gen Wow. And to support engagement with parents in mitigating that learning loss for our students that are attending at-home learning, we currently offer extended learning opportunities through virtual tutoring, face-to-face -face tutoring, and counseling. Our students that are learning from at home can actually come in once a week if they need to in the evenings or on Saturday so they can be provided tutoring and counseling. And yes, we use those social workers and those PELs to round our students up to find them and to get them the support they need. In January, we're looking at um, having virtual learning labs for our parents on our priority standards and our focus calendars really outlining what their students need to be able to know and do as it relates to that focus calendar and the priority standards. And we're also going to offer flexible scheduling for our students where parents wanna come in for two periods, three periods or half a day, we're gonna work with them to meet their needs. So we're really doing everything possible to reach our parents so that they can support our children and we can mitigate that learning loss. Thank you. Ricky, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, June. Kathy, Ricky, would you unmute yourself, please? Yes, I just had to keep uh, <laughs> company with Kathy. Uh, I just wanted to say that that's a very different way of working with parents than we've done in the past, where they are now true partners and having the information they need to work with their students and help uh, their their learning progress. So we've done a lot of new things this year. You've had a lot of experiences and probably learned quite a few lessons about things that you might do differently in the future to make, the, make greater progress with unfinished learning and essential content. So uh, let's start with Sophia. What are some of the things that you've learned? I think the biggest lesson we've all learned is that we won't be returning to normal. It was very clear to, to all of us that normal wasn't working for the majority of our students. And I wanna take a minute just to share a, a story. Before we launched our math initiative uh, two years ago, we um, as a district leadership team in collaboration with Patrick Callahan, who's um, as part of our panel, spent a uh, tremendous time ensuring that we went to every single classroom, high school classroom throughout the district. So every high school math teacher knew who we were. They had seen our faces because we spent time in their classrooms. And that gained, it gave us a lot of credibility with the department, math departments across the district. So that was a real game changer for us. And I share that story because it's connected to this idea that we won't be going back to normal because we observed with our own eyes the quality of instruction that was happening at that time. And we, needed, we, kn we knew that there needed to be major shifts, um, not just in curriculum, but also in instruction and assessment. And so our goal was to really reimagine those three critical areas, which we call the instructional core. And that's what our work has really been about. That's great. Kathy, uh, what kinds of lessons have you learned? Kathy Schuler, right? We have- Oh, two Kathy, Kathy Martin okay. from Denver. What lessons Thank have you. you learned in Denver? Thank you. So, I would say the top lesson that we've learned, and we've learned a lot, Ricky, is that equity must stay at the forefront of all of our work. That we have to make all of our decisions all, and determine all of our strategies based upon a focus on equity. And one of the things that we've done uh, district-wide is we identified specific educator mindsets. And two of them um, are uh, my own responsibility. So understanding what is my responsibility and then high expectations, which I mentioned earlier. And so 
all of our professional learning. It um, involves discussion of how those mindsets are playing out in the learning that we're doing and how that will support uh, students' mindsets uh, in the classroom. That's one aspect. But a second aspect is we've really focused on weekly district-wide disaggregated data reviews so that we can drive just-in-time action um, at the central level so that we can support schools in doing so. Well, now let's hear from Kathy Shula. What lessons have you learned? So continuous improvement has to be the model and flexibility. You know, we just can't assume that providing a priority and a focused calendar and telling our teachers and staff to address small learning, you can do it through small group and extended learning opportunities um, to mitigate the learning loss. We really have to have a laser-like focus on narrowing the achievement gap by identifying students in need of additional support and really being creative and getting the support those students need. We also have to support our principals, our teachers and our schools and provide additional PD by modeling where, when and how these gaps can be addressed through multiple learning modalities. So that's a lot again about teachers, professional development. Um, any other comments on, on the need for that kind of professional development and how you plan to do it? Ricky, if I may, I'd like to add, uh, as related to professional development, one of the key things that uh, we did in San Diego Unified is we had school teams come to professional development together, which included principal, vice principals, and some lead math teachers. And so we actually engaged school teams in thinking about uh, the mindsets around mathematics, building that classroom community that's welcoming and warm and focused on rigor and authentic learning. And then we also had um, our educators and leaders doing math together. And one of the best things we did, and, and uh, Patrick was very strategic in doing this, he basically said, give the marker, give the pen to the principal in the group because principals were relying on their, their math uh, teachers to, to lead the math uh, calculations. And so doing math together uh, was really a, a key strategy for us as well. So that working together, and I believe that Denver mentioned something very similar. And uh, Allison, is that happening in Los Angeles as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, we've been saying a lot that in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And I think that um, this for us has not only highlighted, like we shared today, how to listen to students and teachers and principals, what's working, but also outside the district. I think that this um, crisis has really brought the whole country together. Um, and you know, through through venues that such as you provided with the Council of Great City Schools, um, Dr. Mancini, for example, hosted a, our leadership team with her teachers the other day, and. Uh, walked us through how to do that simultaneous teaching because they're back in school and we're not yet. At so um, I think those yes. district to district partnerships are important as as well as the partnerships with um, our private sector and our and our philanthropic partners. I think that they've really come to the table to support us in this time of need. And so kind of the whole ecosystem working together. And uh, lastly, I'll just say, you know, we we had made that decision about the TUDA and the NAEP, and it literally was an act of Congress. And, you know, we always say, use it as a, as a metaphor, but when things need to happen in a time of crisis, we make them happen collectively. And I think that that's been a huge learning for us um, in Los Angeles, that nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible. So Denise, do you have any questions that you've seen that you'd like to pose to the panel? Yes, I, there were a couple of questions um, specifically about uh, formative assessment. And um, if I'm not mistaken, this was one directed to the San Diego group about what does an asset-based assessment look like? 
Um, and then I think I have one as well for Los Angeles. So uh, Allie, I don't know if you, uh, Dr. Sophia or Patrick would like to handle that. I can answer that one. Um, so what I, what I wrote in the chat is that we really wanted to design this with the approach of what are, what are the funds of knowledge that students are showing us in this space, not to focus on all the things they don't know. Um, and then the, when I responded to Glenn, he sent me a private message. So I ended up sending him a big paragraph. <laughs> I'm going to describe to you the three things that I shared. Good. So one of the things that makes it exciting is it, it's an all constructed response assessment and we anticipate what the student answers might be. But a week after the assessment, we have a window where we go into the student responses and we do an inventory and we capture all the beautiful diverse ways that kids wrote the correct answer. Um, so that's a, a wonder, wonderful way to open up um, access and really explore and find where the correct answers are, are hiding from us. Another thing we did is we also created, what was the second thing I wanted to say? Uh, oh, the other thing we did is we disabled the overall average. So we didn't, we didn't wanna reduce student understanding to just the, how they performed across the bar. We only look at the assessments in terms of knowledge application and communication, which jumps us to, to the assumption that students will have strengths, uh, areas of strength and areas of growth in multiple ways. So it kind of shows off that we are kind of uh, multi-dimensional um, areas of, of understanding in mathematics. And lastly, we have a really beautiful way that we look at communication, um, our communication responses. We have a framework that's really grounded in feedback. It's not about scoring. It's really about revision and re-engagement. Thank you, Allie. Um, there was also a question about uh, what is the, uh, if if you could give us an idea about the percent of students participating in assessments, that may be too granular, but that was a question that I saw. And then there's another about how do we provide teachers the time they need to do the intensive planning that San Diego and Denver highlighted this evening. So how are you providing teachers the time they need to do that type of planning? So I'll answer about the, the assessment piece. So, uh, because I see it every week, right? And, you know, I'm gonna be honest, the relationships we've, you know, those are so important. The relationships that the teachers build with their students. And when they have built that really strong trusting relationship, uh, when I tell you the students come into class, like we're taking diagnostic today, right? We're taking it today. They're so excited. And they excited. participate at such a high level uh, versus, you know, and there's classrooms that that is not as high, but we are seeing about on a weekly basis, we do get about 60% of students participating regularly with these assessments. And then of course, it's uh, digging in deeper to get those students um, who maybe didn't show to class or forgot to hit submit. But, um, you know, it varies, but good relationships can drive a whole lot of learning for sure. And they probably having good relationships probably drives a lot of what's needed to make time for teacher professional development. Uh, can you post that question one more time that came from the audience, I think? Because Heather's right in the, in the importance of that excitement and that, that uh, students are showing, but also for teachers. So there was so, a question that so, was posted. Yeah, the, Ricky, the question was, and I think June is putting it up now. Good. Uh, specifically for San Diego and Denver, um, how do you provide teachers the time they need to do this kind of intensive planning? Because they saw that that was something that you both had spoke, talked about a great deal. I can respond for um, San Diego Unified. One of the things that we did um, with our schedules for this school year, um, because we're remote learning and online learning, is that we condensed the number of courses that students were taking at the secondary level. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a single student um, in San Diego Unified that's taking all six courses that they would be taking on a, in a normal case. And so students are taking three courses. Um, most of our students are only taking three courses at any given point. The reason I share that is because what that allows is what we call flex time in the teacher's schedule. 
So our schedules have allowed ample planning time for our educators um, at the end of the day. And so that's where uh, this planning, this collaboration, this uh, PD is taking place during, uh, during that flex time. And um, Denver, Denver? So in Denver, um, we have what we call teal days on our calendar. It's the color of the day on the calendar. So it's what it is, is a, a professional learning day that's um, directed by uh, the central office. And so we've really dedicated those days to uh, giving teachers time to plan there and even doing some of um, leading some of those sessions the, uh, from the central um, office folks. The other thing that our uh, teachers have is uh, dedicated weekly professional learning time at the school level that they can uh, use to engage in the deep planning. Um, what we find is that if we spend more time deeply planning a unit, the lesson planning uh, goes smoother and faster because we know how that lesson really fits in. We know what the intended learning is there and how to spend the time to develop that so that it fits in the entire unit. What I find interesting in all of these answers is how different districts solve the problem in different ways. And it has to fit the context for that district. It also underscores that while central office can do a great deal, it still comes down to the leadership in the building that take what's happening centrally and elevate it in their buildings to make it something that teachers want to do and take the time to do. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you are probably thinking about additional ways to make time for teachers to work together, plan together, deepen their knowledge together. And I'm sure that's something that you're working on for the future. There's just never enough of that time. Yeah, there was a there was one question that's really interesting about engaging the youngest learners because we've talked a lot about secondary, but in terms of K five, how how are you assessing them remotely? But more importantly, how are you engaging them in instruction and developing their own agency as we as we look at this? So, are there any specific things that you would, that anybody would want to share? I don't know. I will say for San Diego, one of the things we're quite proud of is that we started the DEMI assessment work in secondary, but this fall we uh, expanded and piloted in elementary. We had a two, three grade band and a four, five. And some of the items we asked the two, three or four, five, we also asked um, middle school. So we could really see this story of these domains. Um, and uh, the other thing is because these are constructed responses, the second and third graders were beautiful and creative and came up with so many um, different ways of um, answering the question and sharing their mathematical reasoning. And we think a lot when you focus narrowly on computation or multiple choice, you really lose all of that voice and that agency mm -hmm. and that creativity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're really excited about the work that's happening at the elementary level. The Good. TK1 is our next step and we're going to be more creative because they do not always have the um, reading and writing skills. So we're looking at using video um, and other possibilities mm -hmm. to capture mm -hmm. their voice and their reasoning. Good, good. All right. That sounds fantastic. We were oh. lucky, um, Ricky, we were lucky in oh, Los good. Angeles that, um, that our board did uh, support us in getting devices for our early education students as well. We serve about 31,000 um, high need students in, in, the prime, in the early education centers. And so, you know, we see them, they're learning how to write their letters on the, on the touch screens of the tablets and, you know, doing tactile things, dancing, you know, doing art, uh, 
drawing and and so all of the social pieces that they're missing uh to being in person they're sort of getting you are getting as much as they can uh, together with the songs and the dances and the learning how to read the early literacy skills so they'll be ready for kindergarten so we were just grateful for that opportunity for our little ones and and what you're also doing is providing that kind of excitement and the kind of engagement with things that are worth learning so that students love school and love the uh, idea of being in school and they will be ready for the subsequent grade levels because you're making sure that they are. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the top of the hour uh, and I don't think we have time for any more questions. So panelists, I, I wanna thank you for sharing a small portion of all the work that you're doing every day to enhance teaching and learning in your districts. And we also thank you participants for joining us. Think of this as an initial conversation. All journeys kind of start from where we are and we keep the goal in mind and we move towards that. We're planning to offer some additional webinars in mathematics and in language arts in the future where you can get to greater detail on the kinds of questions that you're asking. We hope that we sparked some ideas for you tonight that you'll find useful in addressing students' unfinished learning or finding a way to narrow the curriculum so that teachers are working on the most important things so that students will be successful at their grade level with just-in-time supports. And if we can do that, our kids are going to feel confident that we are building on what they know and engaging them in rigorous, meaningful, exciting new learning. We thank you all so much. Happy holidays to everyone too. I just wanna say that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us thank tonight. Thank you all. And thanks panelists. We couldn't do this without you all. Could not. And and they really only did get to give a very small idea of what they're doing. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Panelists, you're getting so many thank yous. So that's really nice to see and hear. Uh, in the chat box is going by so quickly. You can stop the recording, but can we keep the chats